Uh, Mr. Block, question. Thank you, Chairman Luke, and uh, to our presenters, thank you very much. It's very important work that you're doing in the community, and uh, it's too bad that um, you have to do this kind of work, but um, certainly appreciate what you do. Just, what, I wonder what you say to some people that say that uh, your program would actually be encouraging the use of drugs. I'm sure you've heard this before, and you you must have a response to that. Through you, Mr. Chair, to the board. Uh, yes, that is a, a very common question that we do get asked. Um, studies actually show that it, it does not contribute to an increase in drug use. Uh, what it's actually doing is opening the door for them to getting, getting help and once again trying to reduce the risk, understanding that people are going to use drugs until they are wanting to or are able to stop. So we're just trying to assist them along the way. Okay, good, good. That's good to hear. And uh, secondly, um, these, these kits now, um, they're just for distribution. They're not for use in any particular locations, like a safety zone or something like that. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the board, um, we currently don't have injection sites in Haldeman or Norfolk counties. So we are giving members of the public, namely our needle exchange program clients, these kits to use in the locations they choose. So they have access to safe injection supplies. Okay, is there any movement to look at developing, um, I, I don't know what they call them, safety zones or injection sites, um, you know, some place that they can go where they are safe to do it and appropriate places to do it? Um, is there any movement afoot to develop anything like that? Uh, we have seen uh, sites like those come up in Toronto and Vancouver, cities where um, there has been a larger problem. Currently in Haldeman and Norfolk, there hasn't been any discussion on that, but it's definitely something that we can take back to management and maybe one day in the future. Okay, just, just as, wrong, as long as it's, it's uh, an appropriate location where, you know, they're not going to be ridiculed for being in that location where they can feel comfortable and where they with are with other people I guess in yeah we'd want people situations. who are trained um, in case there was right. a medical emergency we'd want those types of people around and okay. in close proximity in case anything were to happen and also in a safe zone as well okay good thank you very much keep up the good work mr. Columbus two questions mr. chairman uh, what percentage of the drug users are using your harm reduction program like going to the certain places for needles and that type of thing. Like, you must be missing some of them. So what percentage are using it? That's a difficult one to answer as to the exact percentage because we don't have an accurate number as to how many people are actually using the drugs. Like, we have a general idea, but we don't have exact numbers, so it's, it's hard to say. Um, but I think based on the numbers showing that we're increasing the supplies we're giving out each year, I think that's a, a good indication that the program is spreading and that more people are accessing it. And what is the cost of operating this program? I know you're, you mentioned free several times, the service is free, but there must be a cost somewhere to the taxpayer. So what's the budget expended on it provincially and locally? So we do have a budget from the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care and each public health unit does have an allocated budget. Um, so that budget will only cover the costs of purchasing those needles and syringes, the sharps containers, and the associated disposal costs. It doesn't cover staff time or anything like that. Uh, it can only be specifically for those three things. And then um, the rest of the supplies that are in the kits, again, it's funded through the ministry, but we get it for free, and so do all the other health units. So what is the budget, the dollar number? It's $40,000. 48? 40. 40. 40. Okay, thank you. Mr. Oliver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies, for your presentation. On page uh, four of the staff report that deals with this, one of the one stat that hit me over the head stronger than any others was the degree of opioid use, as you describe it, um, high strength opioids when compared to any other communities in Ontario, Norfolk and Haldeman were number one. And that is that prescription opioids? Okay. Yes. My question then, 
and, and it may seem like a dumb one to you, but are, are all of our physicians within Norfolk and Haldeman counties aware that we are the highest communities in the province for prescribing this particular dangerous medication? That's a very good question. Um, I'm not sure if they're all aware. This is information that I know our LINs have, um, which a lot of the physicians are involved with. Um, it's definitely information that we want to get out there, which yeah. is why, again, we're going to be having these community events as well so that we can start having that conversation because it's important, too, for not just the physicians but the individuals who may be taking these prescriptions yeah. to understand what the potential risks and stuff are as well so that they can have that conversation with their family doctor. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure, if nothing else, the media is going to, I hope, pick up on it today. But it is important, and I'm sure your health unit uh, will communicate the results of this uh, study to the doctors. Thank you. Mr. Height. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, through you to the pre presenters, I had a question the same as Mr. Oliver. I said, illegal drugs are pharmaceutical, but it is pharmaceutical products being used for recreational purposes that are causing us these problems. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, to the board. Um, it's mainly pharmaceuticals, but then there is a illicit component to it as well, where um, some of these drugs are coming from overseas. They be, could be coming from China, and then people are ordering them online. They're being brought into the country illegally as well. So they may have started um, in a pharmacy, or they could have started illegally in any facility where they're just being produced, and then they make it onto the street. And then the unfortunate thing with that is that um, people who are purchasing these drugs they don't know what's in them exactly. And that could be another reason why we're seeing so many overdoses. Um, fentanyl is a very potent opioid that's been put into a lot of street drugs. If someone thinks they're purchasing heroin and it actually is laced with fentanyl, they could do too much of that drug and that could lead to an overdose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see that. It, it's kind of weird. The more needles that you give out, the more overdoses you see. And obviously, like from those, those charts that you had earlier, so. I guess there's less hep C, and that's the good part of all of this. Is that correct, your success? So yes, we are giving out a substantial number of needles, but that doesn't necessarily correlate with the number of overdoses. This is something that's being seen across the country, um, and hoping that by handing out these needles and syringes, we can then have the conversation with these individuals about naloxone, and do they have one? Because uh, just because we're giving them the needles, it doesn't mean that they are necessarily using more than they normally would. A lot of it just comes down to they don't know what is in the drug that they're using and they think they're using, say, cocaine, and then it happens to have fentanyl in it and they're not used to that and then they overdose. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned you were working with the police department somewhat on, I guess, them handling it safely, but what are they doing on the other side of it? And that's the crime side of it. Have you been talking to them about that at all? Um, I'm not aware of what the police, um, o Norfolk OPP or Haldeman County would be doing in regards to um, uh, people they apprehend who are carrying illegal drugs. But the Good Samaritan law has recently come into play about two weeks ago. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with that law, but it's something where if someone does call 911 in regards to an overdose um, and police are called, the police will not arrest um, the person who called 911 in regards to um, um, illegal drug use or having drug paraphernalia on them. So that, that to my knowledge at this time, it would be the only development that I'm aware of in regards to Haldeman OPP or Norfolk OPP okay. and um, illegal drug use. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from board members? There is a recommendation on page 10 of the report. I have uh, board member Oliver seconding it. I need a mover. Mr. Wells? Wells is moved. Oliver is seconded. That staff report HS 1710, the Haldeman Norfolk Health Unit Harm Reduction Program be received as information and that the Board of Health make harm reduction a priority in our organization and community and promote evidence-informed harm reduction strategies in response to local need. Any discussion? Those in favor? It's carried. And once again, ladies, thank you very much for your work and your presentation this evening. Our last <coughs> staff report is...
17-11, found on page 19 of your agenda. This is the funding agreement to support Immunization Ontario extensions, and it involves a budget amendment. And uh, you're still here, Susan? Okay. I'll take it away, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and through you to the board. Um, what this report is is asking for is support to accept funding in the amount of $36,134 that is available to the health unit to support our ongoing work um, with the adoption <coughs> of uh, a piece of software that's called Panorama. So for folks who might remember back in the days when we used to use the little yellow cards to track our immunizations, um, what we're able to do now through Panorama, which is a common platform across the province, is have a common place where all of those immunizations are tracked. Um, currently what happens is the family member um, enters the information, we receive the information, and then we have to re-enter it into Panorama because there's not a seamless interface. So one of the things that this funding would allow us to do is to create that seamless interface so that our staff don't actually have to enter the information. Families and family doctors would be able to do that. So that would be one piece. The other piece to it is for our nurses who are out in the field through vaccination clinics, again, oftentimes if they don't have um, a particular internet connection, then they're not able to enter directly to Panorama, so they need to go back to tracking pencil and paper and then come back to the office and enter. Again, it's a duplication of time and effort, um, and it's, it's a decreased efficiency perspective and increase in, in errors, and so this would allow them to enter directly into Panorama from the field. And then finally, what will happen, because we're able to have um, better information that's available more seamlessly, is we'll get better statistics out. So we'll have better information going in, better information coming out, so it'll allow us to better monitor um, our communities and monitor our vaccination rates um, across our communities. Um, so this $36,000 is for work that would make sense um, from the perspective of increasing our efficiency and increasing the utilization of the software platform that's already there. Um, and it would be work that, that is uh, largely supported through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care as well. Thank you, Susan. So certainly no tax levy uh, is affected, but a budget amendment to show the funding is an in and the expense is an out. That is correct. Questions? Mr. Columbus. Well, Susan has explained it well. I will move the recommendation as printed on page 19 of the agenda. Okay. Mr. Height. Mayor Luke, in the contract, in the fine print on page 24, it has the city of Simcoe as being the person, the leaseor or the sponsor, I guess they call it. I don't know that Simcoe is a city just yet. Okay. Uh, the second whereas. Right. Okay. Um, so, so thank you for, for drawing that to our attention. We can certainly loop back and check on that. Thank you. Thank you. Anything further? Moved by Mr. Walls, seconded by Mr. Oliver. That's staff report HS 1711. This is the funding agreement to support immunization Ontario extensions that we receive it. Has information that the Board of Health enters into a legal agreement with Canada Health Info way to secure up to $36,134 in funding to support the adoption of Immunization Ontario Extensions. And further, that the approved 2017 Board of Health budget be amended to include $36,134 for the Immunization Ontario Extension Program with funding to be provided 100% from Canada Health Info way. Any discussion on this motion? Hearing none, those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you, Susan. Susan, three communication items at the uh, bottom of this agenda. Uh, it's been moved by Wells and seconded by Member Oliver that communication items 4A, 4B, and 4C be received as information. The first one is on the drinking water hauler inspection program for Haldeman Norfolk. Second is on rabies surveillance investigations and low-cost clinics, and finally, uh, a fair amount of information on the follow-up of the operational audit and the final report of February this year. Anything in those three items of correspondence you wish to discuss? Receive as information, those in favor? It's carried, thank you.
Any other business to come before this Board of Health meeting? Confirming bylaw, moved by Member Wells, seconded by Member Oliver, that the bylaw 2017-06 is a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the Board of Health on this 23rd of May 2017, that it be approved, signed by the Chair and the Clerk, and affixed with the corporate seal. Those in favor? It's carried. We are now finished with our Board of Health agenda for this afternoon. Thank you. Need a short break? Sure. I'll come and get you in five to ten minutes. Thank you.
I'd like to uh, get going. Uh, so we are back on our council agenda now. We did start at 3 o'clock. I'd like to welcome everybody here for our meeting. We did start our council meeting at 3 o'clock, and we are certainly behind at the moment. I apologize for that. We'll keep pushing forward and try to get things uh, moving along here. Certainly our deputations and our public meeting uh, are both uh, scheduled for 5 o'clock. I've decided I'm going to do the public meeting. Uh, the two applications first, they will probably in my opinion, not take that long. And then we will get to our two deputations and right after that, the, uh, the motion from Councillor Height to follow our second deputation. I now officially open the public meetings held under the Planning Act and the Municipal Act. I advise all those in attendance that the Ontario Municipal Board has the power under the Planning Act to dismiss an appeal to either a zoning law, sorry, a zoning bylaw and or an official plan amendment if the appellant does not make oral submissions at this public meeting or does not make written submissions to Norfolk County Council before the zoning bylaw is passed and or before the official plan amendment is adopted. I'd like to advise those in attendance this evening that these meetings are televised and web streamed and all items discussed are a matter of public record. If you will go in your agenda, councillors, to page 10. Our first staff report is DCS 17-11. <coughs> This application has been received to change the zoning of the subject lands from urban residential type 1 and urban residential type 2 to neighborhood institution. The applicant is proposing to sever the north half of the subject lands and add them to the parcel to the south as a boundary adjustment and then add the entire subject lands to the church property in the future. Grace Baptist Church and Agent R.C. Dixon have put forth the application affecting the lands described as 747 Norfolk Street North in Simcoe. I do now open the public meeting on this application. Alicia, I see you're here. Good to see you. Uh, would you please present the report to council? Thank you. An application has been received to rezone the subject lands from urban residential type one and urban residential type two to neighborhood institutional. The lands are 1.2 acres in size and are part of residential parcels that front onto the east side of Norfolk Street North in the urban area of Simcoe. The lands are vacant. The purpose of this application is to allow for future boundary adjustments. So if I could draw your attention to the screen, the subject lands are hatched in red here. They are part of two residential parcels the first application would sever the north half here and add it to this parcel. And then in the future, all of this would be severed and added to the church property. And then it, the final lot shape would be what's outlined in yellow here. So hopefully that makes sense. It is community planning staff's opinion that this is appropriate development in this area. It is good planning to rezone the lands all at once so the zoning will be consistent in the future on the newly created lot and it will be appropriately zoned for the church use as neighborhood institutional. Planning staff support this application and recommend that it be approved. Thank you very much, Alicia. Any questions from Council? Councillor Black, please. <clears throat> Mayor Luke, thank you very much for you to staff. Alicia, thank you very much. And uh, just wondering, um, it's uh, an application from the church, but do we actually have agreement from the two property owners? Through the chair, the church is a part owner of both of those properties. Okay. Uh, I kind of suspected that. I used, to, I, know, I used to know who owned those properties before, a while back. Um, will the remaining part of the land, uh, is there adequate space for septic system? Because I know it's septic and, and on their own water out there so there's still adequate space for septic and water through the chair that will be addressed at the consent stage to ensure that there is enough space and they did take into consideration the location of the septic beds yep okay good thank you thank you any other questions to our planner not at this time i'll move on i know that mr dixon is here 
You're not here. Thank you. I would ask if anyone uh, wishes to speak in favor of the application, if they would come forth. forth and uh, as always, we will always allow the applicant or the agent to speak first. So Mr. Dixon doesn't have anything at this time to add to the report. Is there anyone else in attendance who wishes to speak in support of this application? Is there anyone in attendance who wishes to speak in opposition or in general to this application? Hearing none, anything further from members of council? I would need a mover and seconder to close this public meeting. Councillor Geisens has moved. Councillor Columbus has seconded that we close the public meeting. All in favor? The meeting is closed. Thank you. What is your wish, Council? Councillor Brenton, please. Thank you, Mayor Luke. I'll move the recommendation in the report. Thank you very much. I'll need a seconder. Councillor Height has seconded that the application by Grace Baptist Church, 735 Norfolk Street North and Simcoe, that this application be approved for reasons set out in this report, DCS 17-11, and that no public input has been received for this application and therefore will not be considered as part of this decision. Is there any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor of approval? That's carried, thank you. We'll go to staff report DCS 17-36 found on page 20 of your agenda. An application has been received to add a special provision 14-920 to the subject lands. This is to permit the construction of an accessory building requiring relief, relief of the following. First, two meters from the maximum permitted height of an accessory building of six meters to permit a height of eight meters. Also, 186 meters from the maximum permitted usable floor area for accessory buildings of 100 square meters to permit a total, total usable floor area of 286 square meters. And this will include several residential accessory buildings on the property. Neil Herwinen, on behalf of Helen Michelle Herwinen, has put forth the application affecting the lands described as 1184 Concession 14 at RR4 Simcoe. I will now officially open the public meeting, DCS 1736. And Leisha, this is your report as well. If you'd uh, go ahead, that'd be great. An application has been received to construct a detached garage accessory to the residential use on the subject lands. The subject lands front onto the south side of Concession 14 Townsend and are approximately three acres in size. They contain a single detached dwelling, a pool, pool house, and a shed, and they are zoned and designated agricultural. It is community planning staff's opinion that this is appropriate development in the agricultural area. The detached garage will be used for personal storage with minimal impacts as a result. The property is heavily treed, which blocks the garage from view of all surrounding neighboring property owners as well as from the road. And it will be accessory to the primary, primary residential <coughs> use on the property. Community planning staff support this application and recommend that it be approved. Thank you, Alicia. Questions from council? Councillor Height. Thank you, Mayor Luke. Uh, through you to planning, I guess the way our zoning bylaw has it now, it's only the building only has a maximum permitted height of 20 feet. Is, is that to eliminate any two stories? Through the chair, uh, it is six meters, and I think it's just to keep it in scale with residential and ensure that it is secondary to the use. Okay, seeing as how this is more in a country home, would it not have a different zoning bylaw, like more, like with a farm barn or AG barn? Through the chair, it is, we do permit larger, almost double the size um, for usable floor area in the agricultural zone compared to the residential zones. Um, and the height, they are allowed one meter higher. 
Okay. You also might mention that it didn't qualify as minor development, but in your calculations from the 100 square meter permitted, you're including all of his accessory buildings, plus you're including the usable floor space on the second floor. Yep. So how much bigger is this, the footprint of this building, the foundation area size? I'll have to look that up. So the, uh, through the chair, the new accessory building is 250 square meters in size. And the, actually I might, sorry. Um, the ground floor is 193.2 square meters. 193? Okay. So then, <clears throat> so the accessory buildings aren't really that large. Through the chair, they're not. And the second story is not a full second story. And in our zoning bylaw and our definitions, do we have the, the, what is that, what do you call that, the usable floor area as being defined? Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions to Alicia? Are the Hawaiians or an agent to hear on their behalf? Is the applicant here? No? This time I would ask if there's anyone wishing to speak in favor of the application to come forward, please. Speak in favor. Is there anyone in attendance that desires to speak against or in general to the application? Anything further from council? I would ask then for a motion. Wells moved, seconder to close. Oliver, Wells and Oliver to close this public meeting. Those in favor? This meeting is now closed. Carried, thank you. Councillor Black, please. Mayor Luke, uh, I would be pleased to move the recommendation contained within the report. Thank you, sir. Councillor Columbus has seconded. Second. Black has moved. Columbus has seconded that the application of Neil Herwinen at 1184 Concession 14 at R4 Simcoe. This affects the lands described as part of Lot 15, Concession 14 in the geographic township of Townsend. This is to amend our zoning bylaw 1Z 2014 uh, that this application be approved for reasons as set out in 17-36 report and that no public input has been received for the application and then for, therefore will not be considered as part of the decision. Discussions? Those in favor? It's carried. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. All right, we'll move on then now. There are no presentations, but we have two deputations. Our first deputation is from Mr. Bunting, and this is respecting our, de our de development processing timelines. Sam, if you want to come forward, and uh, I'm sure you know that we'll give you a full 10 minutes, and when you hit the nine-minute mark, I'll uh, certainly throw the flag out on the floor there so you can be warned that the end is near. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. We're, just a ten, we're, we're getting there. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Chair to Council, my name is Sam Bunting. I am owner of Keystone Design Group. I am the architect um, slash project manager for Prominent Homes, and I am a past president of the Haldeman Norfolk Home Builders Association. I'm here tonight on behalf of the Haldeman Norfolk Home Builders Association. Um, Norfolk County has been blessed recently with the large population growth due to the recent boom in economy in Ontario. The Home Builders Association has been blessed through this large growth um, to have more homes to be built in Norfolk County. Um, in 2016, we seen over $110 million in new construction growth in Norfolk County. And this was also stated by Mr. Mayor at one of his recent um, events. 
Um, Haldeman Norfolk Home Builders is extremely concerned about Norfolk's future. And not only Norfolk's future, but the future of the jobs for home builders and our subcontractors as well. Um, I was extremely surprised to receive a phone call from my FM, one of the journalists there, stating that Norfolk County staff have released a memo, um, and, and that memo was from Norfolk County's Planning Department and Public Works Department, stating major delays in approvals coming from Norfolk County. Um, these delays range from um, draft plan agreements, um, condominium agreements, and these, pros, these applications normally take three to six months to get approvals for. They are forecasting three to 12, or sorry, nine to 12 month um, approvals, which is double the current time. Um, to go along with these approvals, there are in increasing site plan application approvals, zoning bylaw application approvals, and, and some more as well. Um, these delays pose risks to um, Norfolk builders in this county. Um, having experience recently with submitting a condo application agreement um, and a site plan application agreement for the new Simcoe Springs edition that we're currently building. We have first-hand experience with the lengthy delays that currently exist with Norfolk County and any extra delays added on to these current delays are uh, very risky for jobs in Norfolk County. Norfolk County and I feel and the Holman Norfolk Home Builders Association feels that they jeopardize jobs for, for us as home builders and our tradesmen. And, and we feel that it jeopardizes, jeopardizes thousands of jobs in Norfolk County. Um, how will these delays jeopardize jobs? Um, excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, just to give you an example, prominent homes, two years ago we built 12 homes. On average, in the past few years before that, we were building about 10 to 12 homes a year. Last year we built 19 homes, and the, the following year, this year, we expect to build over 20 homes. And in that current time, we've had to increase the amount of staff in order to fulfill this, this larger role and increase. Currently, Prominent Homes, we do not have a lot that is not sold. So we have no lots that are available that are unsold. So we have set our, our guide or our, our building um, timeline and we have the rest of the year that we're booked for builds and we have no other lots to sell. Um, so and all of us builders are in the same boat. We all have, having spoken to many other builders on the association, we all don't have lots to sell currently. We all are selling lots at a higher rate than usual. Um, and many of us builders are receiving phone calls every day, every weekend, about people that are interested in building new homes. And when we tell them that we don't have properties to build for you this year. You're going to have to wait till next year. A lot of them are saying, well, you know what? I have to look elsewhere. And they're moving to different counties to build. And with these delays proposed by Norfolk County staff, if we don't have anything to build on for the start of next year, then many of us home builders will be essentially waiting without work. And not only us home builders, but the thousands of, of contractors that we employ. Um, when our developers apply as of June 1st, instead of it taking three weeks, like, nor like the memo stated, for us to hear back, 
it's going to take three months. And many of these applications take three and four applications to get approvals. So every application, we have to wait three months with this new system. So when it takes a 12-month approval, it also takes two months to put in the roads and services. So if our developers are applying now, and it takes a year to June, then it takes a two months, we're looking at the middle of summer in order to have lots available to us to build on. And that is what is jeopardizing jobs in Norfolk County. If we don't have lots available to build on in the spring, then all of us builders and our trades will be waiting. Um, since taking the commitment to do this deputation, I've sent out emails and talked to builders, developers, um, engineers, and planners about how this can be rectified um, and, and many of the issues that they have feel that lead to the delays with planning staff. Some um, planners and engineers said that staff seminars and staff meetings deter them from doing these actual approvals. Um, also, some other comments were paperwork provided from staff. There's a lot of paperwork. Um, a, a planner had told me that Toronto planners, a lot of times their approvals are one page documents. They said in Norfolk County they're receiving 12 and 14 page documents for approvals. Um, and, and other other developers stated that there's a lack of communication from the Public Works Department to even the other departments in Norfolk County. With my own experience with the condo application that we recently <laughs> submitted, um, we found also that we were waiting on Public Works for all of the steps along the way. Um, and not knowing what Public Works the, the problems or issues that are, arise in Public Works, the department, um, I, I don't know whether they need to hire another engineer, a qualified engineer, to approve and make decisions quicker. Um, I know that as of last year and the year previous, lot grading applications were made for every new home construction in Norfolk County. As of June 1st of this year, we no longer are expected to apply for lot grading approvals for every single home. So there were, used to be two public work staff that used to do those approvals. Maybe those staff could be moved into these applications for, for getting out subdivisions sooner for builders. Um, and, if, and if that doesn't work, then we would hope, ask that Norfolk County sub out these approvals and these applications to qualified engineering firms for them to approve on behalf of Norfolk County. Um, when I contacted Norfolk County about these timeline delays, I was very surprised with the reply that I received that they were also not happy about these delays and, and what they said was, there's nothing that we can do about it. This takes effect June 1st. And I received that from a manager in Norfolk County. My dad told me once when he was a millwright working with Siemens Westinghouse that every day that they didn't have one of their turbines sent out on time, they were charged $12,000 each day for that delay. Home builders, every, home builders need to meet a closing date. When we don't meet a closing date, we are liable for the customer's expenses. When Norfolk County is facing major delays, there doesn't seem anything that they can do, Norfolk County staff can do about it. I'm here on behalf of the Holman Norfolk Home Builders Association and the Norfolk construction industry that produced $110 million of new construction last year in 2016. I'm here to ask you to take this matter serious and, and we're asking that you help us have lots to build on and can, that we can do our jobs and continue our work, not only in the fall of this year, but for the spring of next year. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Be any questions from council members? Councillor Brunton. Thank you, Mayor Luke. Uh, my question through you to uh, Mr. Bunting. 
you mentioned in there that you no longer require lot grading. Lot grading is part of the uh, overall subdivision, but how do you go about it now versus? Okay, before we used to submit an application in Delhi, and the people at Public Works Department would approve it and send their approval to Simcoe. At the current present time, we are we're submitting a lot grading application, yes, but our surveyor is now required to give a written letter that states that he takes liability for the, the design. So whereas before when Norfolk County submitted an approval, Norfolk County had liability for the lot grading design, whereas now they've given the liability to the surveyors that do the design and expect them to do the design properly. But he just follows the overall grading plan? In most cases, yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, my other question to you, uh, your company though, you're not a developer, you're a home builder? We are currently a home builder. We have submitted for our first development application, a condominium complex in Waterford. Oh, okay. So we are getting into developing, yes. And you're, and you're uh, I guess, to put it blunt, you're, the development is a little bit different than building a home in terms of uh, approvals and delays and so forth. So yes, yes, aware that. yes. Uh, uh, to, to get approval for a building permit, it takes. They were taking longer than two weeks last year, and we came right. in to council and asked for additional staff. Once they had them, they were e able to meet a two-week permit approval timeline. Right. Um, whereas development is, it seems to be taking six six months. A little different game. Uh, Definitely. But uh, but the building's going good as far as timing. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Councillor Height, please. Thank you, Mayor Luke, and uh, through you to the deputation. You you mentioned uh, in in your speech there about subbing out all the engineering. I know you only mentioned a few other municipalities, but did any of them <coughs> sub out that engineering? Function? We are, we have heard through surveyors through other counties that their um, other counties are meeting the three month timelines, I guess, or, or application timelines. They're not doing any extensions from what we've heard through mm -hmm. other counties. Um, so they, so I would say no, they're not subbing out to other engineers. No, they're firms. actually meeting their demands? They're meeting their demands, yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Further? Sam, I just want to say that uh, certainly I have been getting correspondence from builders slash developers, quite a little collection here, and I listen when they tell me their frustrations of delays. I'm certainly aware of them. Um, one of the things that I'm told over and over is that site plan control on a project, going through a site plan control, in some of their words, or the one here that I'm looking at is, that site plan control is a nightmare for developers. You want to comment on that statement? Uh, yes, we actually went through a site plan control with Simcoe Springs. Um, I, I actually was walking into the building department and looking to apply for a building permit when I found out that it was under site plan control and I believe I found out in August yeah in August or or September when I went in for a building permit um, so I had told the owner well you know we'll apply for site plan control site plan application and hopefully we'll get started in the fall um, so I applied hoping that we'd hear back and couple months and two months went by and you know I was pleading with Norfolk County staff to meet this deadline so we could get a foundation in the ground so that we could start before the winter hit and we missed our deadline and we had to wait for the spring. Um, I believe we got so starting in the spring we were planning on starting in March. I believe we got the final submission and the paperwork signed in February so not only did was I hopeful to start in November, we didn't get the final approval signed until February. So it was a very lengthy process for our first time, probably due to a little bit of our inexperience, but it was very long. 
Sam, I'm not going to go over all these tonight. Uh, I think it's something we need to look into. Uh, another one that uh, I've been told more than once is that conditions of a site plan five, ten years ago were sometimes 25 to 30 items to meet. Some site plans today have over 70. Is that a fair statement? Again, I don't know. I'm not a builder or developer, but I, I have a list of their concerns I've summarized, and these are the types of things that, you know, it just seems to be it's always changing. It's, 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 it's always seems to be there's more and more and more and more needed all the time. Do you, do you wish to comment on that? I, for my minimal amount of experience with developing, um, I haven't seen that yet, but I've heard of what you're saying, yes. And, I, and I've also heard that, you know, that developers and engineers will sit around a table and they'll ask staff to make a decision and staff won't, they'll, they'll wait until, they'll defer the decision until they, they've looked at it longer and, and had given it more thought. So yes, there is a lot more complexity to developing it nowadays than there ever was, for sure. But I think there's a lot more liability now than there ever was as yeah. well. Sam, I want to just finish by saying that I talk to a lot of our planners on a, not a daily basis, no, but on a substantially, I should say on a fairly regular weekly basis, different planners. And, and I have to say that I find our planners to be very competent and I find them to be very diligent in their, the work they do. Um, and I hope you'll agree with that. That's, uh, I absolutely do, yes. So tell me, what's the solution? What are your thoughts? You're, you're on the developer side. You're not on the inside. You're yes. there saying, I got, I got customers. I've got a job to do. I've got timelines to meet. I don't want a spring uh, startup on a, on a subdivision phase or a home to turn into a fall or even a following spring. Yes. spring.